Okay. Um, so as Don said, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, niche properties and niche construction uh, by the fungus uh, Sulolus pungens. And there we go. So I think today um, what I'm going to try and do is um, argue that uh, one of the major gaps uh, in our understanding of fungal community ecology uh, is really a lack of detailed information about the details uh, of individual species. Um, and uh, you know we're all aware and we've seen lots of examples of um, how high throughput sequencing has really revolutionized uh, our understanding of fungal communities uh, and how it's getting exponentially uh, easier and cheaper with time. Um, and as a result, um, I think we know a lot uh, about um, overall uh, changes in community composition, sort of similar to this uh, you know, cartoon I've showed you on the left here. Um, so we do a lot of sequencing. Uh, we can look at the samples from habitat one and habitat two, um, and we can compare the differences in composition. And we often uh, you know, make hypotheses about um, you know, what sort of environmental filters might be determining membership across these two different um, habitat types. Um, and so I guess I would argue that in some ways we know a lot about um, sort of these overall changes in community structure, much more than we do about why those changes occur um, at, say, the individual species level. And, um, you know, this is um, can pose some difficulties because we know that within the you know, species that uh, co-occur in the same site of the same sample or the same habitat, uh, are actually often doing so even if they're responding to very different environmental cues that have brought them to, to that particular place. Um, and so even though we tend to treat, you know, communities as uh, real things, uh, somewhat akin to, if you're familiar, the arguments of, of uh, Clements, one of the earliest, early very influential ecologists who kind of thought of communities as sort of a super organism where all the individual species kind of function to support the whole. Um, in reality, I think that they're often much more like this. Uh, there was a concurrent ecologist named Henry Gleason who argued that really uh, communities don't exist in a real way. They're just really the uh, sum of all these individualistic species responses. Um, and so if we know that species are responding very individualistically to different environmental conditions, and this can cause some problems if we're trying to uh, use these top-down approaches to predict, um, you know, what a fungal community might look like in the future. Um, and, you know, as a mycologist, um, uh, I really like this uh, uh, overall kind of top-down approach, but um, I often feel like I, I want some more details about the you know, fine-grained biology of uh, individual fungal species. And so, you know, my goal for this talk then is really to try and uh, start building, uh, motivating myself and maybe other people to start thinking about how we can build a bottom up approach to fungal community ecology that's rooted uh, in the details of individual species of fungi. Uh, and so today, um, what I am going to do uh, is um, try and uh, give this, uh, give a talk kind of using three vignettes that illustrate what I think uh, can be gained from this approach. Um, and so I'll be, uh, using, um, talking about three different, uh, what I'll call niche axes um, relating to uh, dispersal uh, and recruitment uh, of fungi, uh, some critical soil macronutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, overall um, uh, community composition uh, and uh, chemistry in the soils. And I really want to follow uh, these studies through with a single organism. And this is the ectomycorrhizal fungus, uh, Soilus pungens. Um, you can see this really charismatic photo of it right here. Um, I love the Betsy's photos of uh, all these different cultures, um, and uh, hopefully uh, Suelas uh, strikes you as being equally charismatic. Uh, and ultimately what I want to do is try and use this uh, information that we uh, can glean about these different niche axes to then try and connect it with what, uh, what we know about where this organism occurs in the environment. Um, and, you know, this is going to be an uh, imperfect story uh, since this is kind of a new endeavor for me, trying to think about things through this lens. Um, what I really am hoping to do is show you that by going into a deep dive on a single species, I think this actually helps us in the long run to be able to generalize out a mechanism uh, when we think about um, what's going on in entire fungal communities. Okay, so I want to start uh, by uh, talking about um, dispersal. So this image on the left here shows uh, Point Reyes National Seashore, uh, which is where uh, I've been doing research for a while, where Suelos pungens occurs. Uh, this is just north of San Francisco, about uh, 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on traffic. Um, and really, before going uh, any further, um, I need to acknowledge uh, Tom Bruns, who is gratefully here, um, for really introducing me to the system uh, as a doctoral student uh, and all the work that he's done here, which has made uh, much of my work possible. 
Um, and you can see Tom uh, is here uh, working on his GPS unit with that hammer. Uh, and uh, I hate that Zoom is off, so if this joke was bad, I, I don't know it, uh, but I'm assuming you're all laughing with me right now. Um, and then this is me here um, in San Francisco where I'm sitting right now giving this talk. And you know, one of the reasons that uh, working here has been so appealing is you can look um, in this picture on the right and you can see this very patchy uh, kind of vegetation structure at the coast. Um, and in particular here, there's really one uh, species of pine, uh, which is Pinus miracata or bishop pine. Uh, and this pine is really the only host for Suillus pungens in this area, um, and really the most important ectomycorrhizal tree out in this uh, coastal vegetation. And uh, it occurs in this uh, primarily arbuscular mycorrhizal vegetation matrix, which is made up of things like bishop pine um, and uh, poison oak mostly, as far as I can tell. And, uh, or sorry, of uh, Baccarus poliolaris, which is coyote brush, um, not bishop pine. Uh, and uh, because uh, Sewillus and other ectomycorrhizal fungi are uh, obligate biotrophs, um, this is really an ideal landscape for trying to understand how Sewillus pungens disperses because we can find, uh, you know, find its host pants in this landscape and study how it moves across this uh, fragmented landscape. And so um, I've been studying dispersal of um, ectomycorrhizal fungi in, in a number of ways, but uh, I want to show you some results from a, a recent paper that was led by one of my graduate students, uh, Gabriel Smith. Um, and so because uh, Swillus pungens and other ectomycorrhizal, ectomycorrhizal fungi are host specific, um, we know the location of potential propagule sources, which is the pines, as you can see kind of up at the top of this, uh, top left of this um, slide. Um, and we can measure how well these fungi disperse across this landscape by kind of going out and collecting soils, uh, bringing them back to the lab, and then assaying the colonization of bait seedlings that are growing in the greenhouse like this. And so we can look at you know, the percentage of the root uh, system that's occupied by these fungi and um, use molecular methods to characterize the diversity of these fungi. And so in this cartoon in the bottom where the y-axis shows the percentage of seedlings that are colonized by EM fungi, uh, the percentage of the root system, or percentage of seedlings, sorry, I should say, uh, and the x-axis shows a distance away from established pine trees. Uh, if we see something like this, um, like really no change in colonization of these pine seedlings um, uh, with distance, um, then this would suggest that, um, that there's really no dispersal limitation uh, of these um, fungi and that wherever a pine seedling might establish in this landscape, it's going to be able to find its mutualistic partners. However, if, if you get uh, something like this, where you would see a decrease in the fraction of the seedlings that are colonized, um, this indicates that um, there is probably dispersal limitation and that an establishing pine seedling might not be able to find fungal partners in certain parts of this landscape. Uh, and what we see in reality um, is evidence for fairly rapid decrease in the availability of uh, ectomycorrhizal propagules, which is consistent with this idea of uh, dispersal limitation. Now, um, of course, we don't just want to know if fungi colonize these seedlings, but also who colonizes them. So we've used DNA sequencing to characterize fungi from the individual root tips um, at these different uh, sites. And you know, while this global model shows uh, dispersal limitation, uh, what we see from sequencing uh, are really two important things. The first is that from a total ectomycorrhizal fungal community associating with um, bishop pine at this site, which is probably close to 200 species, there's really only about 20 species of ectomycorrhizal fungi that actually colonize these seedlings. And out of that, there's really only seven in this particular study that appeared with any sort of regular abundance. And so there's a very small fraction of the total ectomycorrhizal fungal community that's actually very good at dispersing. You also notice that these um, fungi uh, individually show different dispersal patterns. So uh, some of these, um, like uh, Helvella vespertina and Tomatella subladasana disappear within a few meters of the forest edge. Uh, whereas some of these, like the Lephora terrestris um, and Suillus pungens, um, who's the star of our show, they're able to colonize seedlings uh, up to you know, a few hundred meters to a kilometer away from the edge of the forest. So they're dispersing quite well. The second thing that uh, you might be noticing is there's actually a pattern for a number of these fungi where they appear to peak in abundance uh, farther away from the forest edge. Uh, which seems sort of counterintuitive. Um, and so, you know, we've been really curious about why you might uh, see patterns like this. All right, and so I'll, I'll explore this maybe with a little bit more of a deep dive into Suillus. So if you focus on Suillus pungens, uh, we know uh, from the figure I just showed you that colonization does peak at a distance. Uh, 
And so one possibility here is that there's some sort of mechanism where its spores tend to preferentially disperse long distances. So they're uh, preferentially deposited farther away from the forest edge than near to the forest edge. Um, but what we know from previous studies uh, is that, that this actually isn't the case. Um, so we've gone out and uh, used kind of spore trapping methods uh, along with uh, Swillis Pungens specific quantitative PCR to you know, count the number of spores um, that reach different areas away from the edge of established pines. And you can see that here on the y-axis, this is um, the spore deposition rate in terms of spores per square centimeter per day. And again, on the x-axis, this is the distance away from established pines. Um, and so we know that the spores do kind of um, monotonically decrease as you move uh, away from the forest edge. So we can rule out that as a potential explanation. The thing we do actually know, though, and this comes from a study by Peter Kennedy, uh, is that Swillis pungent is really a wimpy competitor. And so uh, what this figure shows is that um, this is uh, uh, spore inoculations of Swillis pungens and two other ectomycorrhizal fungi onto bishop pine seedlings. And on the y-axis here, you can see the fraction of the um, root biomass that was colonized. And what you can see is for Swillis pungens, when it's grown by itself, it colonizes a fairly large fraction um, of the um, seedling root system. Whereas uh, when you co-inoculate it with either Rhizopogon salabrosus or Rhizopogon occidentalis, who also uh, were in this last figure I showed you, um, that they totally exclude Swillis pungens from colonizing these seedlings. And so it seems like this incredible dispersal ability that Swillis has, Swillis pungens has, uh, comes at a competitive cost. So, you know, despite the fact that uh, Swillis pungens is a poor competitor, uh, it's actually one of the most common fungi uh, at point rays in early successional settings. Um, and this figure shows what's known as a nestedness diagram uh, from a study of a 10 year old tree or tree islands or tree patches. Um, and this uh, figure, I think, is one of the more interesting parts of uh, this particular study to me. And what this figure shows is the matrix. Um, where the columns uh, are fungi uh, and the rows are tree patches. And so you can go here and these tree patches are kind of arranged, uh, these rows are arranged from sort of the largest tree patches down to the smallest tree patches here. Um, and, uh, you know, everywhere you see a filled cell in this diagram, this is where a particular fungus occurred on a particular tree island patch. Um, and so, for example, Amanita franchetti here, um, occurred really only on this one uh, large tree island that I surveyed, or tree patch that I surveyed. Um, by contrast, you can see uh, far left of this figure, this is Sewellus pungens, and it was really present on every single uh, tree island uh, that I went out and surveyed. All right. Um, and what this figure shows is that uh, the communities that occur on these uh, smaller tree islands are kind of a nested subset or a subset of the uh, communities uh, that occur uh, on these larger tree islands. But the reason I'm showing you this is because I think it says something about um, the importance of these competition colonization trade-offs, because we actually see this uh, nested pattern repeated uh, across uh, studies. And so this is the figure I just showed you from uh, looking at uh, nestedness with these uh, uh, tree island patches uh, arranged according to size. Um, this is the uh, same figure, or this is the same kind of a figure from uh, Gabriel's paper um, that I was just talking about, uh, where these, um, uh, these um, locations are, are arranged uh, from kind of closest to the forest edge to uh, farthest away. You can see that this nestedness pattern is repeated uh, across this distance gradient. Um, and um, you know, what we were able to do then in the same study is take a, a theoretical model that uh, David Tillman had developed about spatial competition, which is based on uh, an assumed dispersal competition trade-off. And using uh, this model, we were able to recreate a nested pattern parameterized with a community that looks someone, uh, something like uh, the community we see in this size gradient study. And so what I, I think we see here is that, um, you know, Sewillis is probably on the extreme end of being really good at competing and being terrible at uh, competition. Um, but that this pattern really generalizes um, across the entire fungal community. Okay, so just to uh, wrap the, uh, up this part of the talk, um, so Sewillus is a great disperser, uh, Sewillus pungens is a great disperser, I should say, even compared with other Sewillus uh, in this particular system. And I think by focusing on the Sewillus, um, where we get all this really detailed information, and since it's at the extreme end of this dispersal and competition spectrum, I think we can actually help to generalize this competition colonization trade-off to be uh, something that is uh, more applicable or widely applicable across the fungal community. And 
more broadly, there's this idea of a regeneration niche, um, which Grubb in 1977 uh, defined to include all the things that are necessary for successful reproduction and dispersal, um, as well as the kinds of environments that favor recruitment. And, and I think that this regeneration niche actually then becomes a really important way in which um, we, ectomycorrhizal fungi differentiate themselves and which hopefully you can see from these nestedness diagrams that we can use to understand patterns of fungal community composition across patterns of say habitat size or isolation uh, or uh, successional time. Okay, so uh, knowing about um, you know, the dispersal and regeneration niche of this fungus, I think helps to explain some of the patterns we see in uh, ectomycorrhizal fungal community organization you know, across uh, spatial or temporal gradients. Um, but next, I want to talk about uh, nutrients, and this is often one of the things that people think about first when they begin to think about ectomycorrhizal fungi. And so up until this point, um, I've been using the term uh, niche or niche um, a bit vaguely. Um, and when there's, while there's lots of different uh, definitions of the term niche, um, probably the one most li widely used is uh, Hutchinson's definition of, of the n-dimensional niche. Um, and there's a good summary quote uh, describing this up above from, from Bob Holt. But essentially, you could think of the niche um, as kind of an abstract space defined by different environmental axes. Um, and so I put, put one up here. Uh, whoops, and I've skipped ahead a little bit. Um, sorry. Um, and you know, we know a lot about these for things like plants. So I've got kind of a cartoon example here for, say, a pine. Um, and this kind of uh, area of, you know, if we know from physiological studies, there's this area of temperature and rainfall. Um, where this pine we know is theoretically able to survive. This is known as the fundamental niche. If you go out in the environment and look for this pine, you'd often find it in some subset of the subset of the environmental conditions we think it can actually tolerate. And this is known as the realized niche. Um, and the difference between these two is thought to result from competitive interactions that might exclude it from uh, other areas that it might otherwise be able to occur in. However, this conceptualization of the niche treats biotic interactions as primarily negative, uh, despite the fact that we know that species are engaged in a large number of positive interactions, such as, of course, uh, ectomycorrhizal symbiosis. And so a number of people, um, myself included, have kind of tried to incorporate this um, into kind of niche models. And the one that I've uh, pro uh, proposed is that you could think about the portion of the, um, this kind of fundamental niche space where uh, uh, a, tree, a species is able to grow in the absence of its positive interactions as its individualistic niche. And then uh, this, uh, you could also think of, think of this mutualistic niche that defines the area of the environmental space it can occupy in the presence of mutualistic interactions, um, which is often likely to be much larger due to the positive effects that mutualisms generally have on physiology. Okay, so how can we go about trying to visualize this uh, mutualistic niche? Um, so uh, for ectomycorrhizal fungi, as I said, probably the most important niche dimensions are the host plants they can colonize, uh, but also the two key macronutrients that we think are the primary currencies they provide for their hosts, so nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, so to try and test some of these ideas about uh, this mutualistic niche, um, a postdoc in my lab, uh, Michael Van Newland and I, uh, designed an experiment to grow pine seedlings in a factorial continuous gradient of nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations. Um, and you can see uh, an example of you know, the experimental layout for one, uh, one replicate of our study here. And so we used uh, seven different uh, factorial combinations of increasing nitrogen and phosphorus uh, concentrations. So seven by seven, uh, a single replicate of this experiment had 49 uh, seedlings in it. Um, so we used an artificial soil so that we could totally control nutrient inputs, um, which we did by modifying this pine-specific fertilizer called the uh, Ingestad solution. Um, we uh, kept the recipe sort of normal, uh, other than changing the nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations from uh, 0.1 to about 6.4 times the normal concentrations used in, in, in Ingestad. So um, to try and connect this back to the mutualistic niche concept, we grew the seedlings either alone, um, inoculated with spores of uh, Swillus pungens, uh, inoculated with spores of Philephora terrestris, one of these other common fungi at point rays, uh, or with spores of uh, both of these fungi. And we waited for about nine months and then harvested the seedlings, uh, weighed their biomass, and me measured the percentage of roots that were colonized by ectomycorrhizal fungi. So what I'm going to show you next is a diagram of the kind of data that I want to present. Um, at the bottom on the X and the Y, you can see this seven by seven combination of the N and the P treatments. And so on the top left, uh, you can see it's N increases. Um, and P is going to stay the same if you kind of stay, hug the axis there. So you get your highest uh, nitrogen to phosphorus ratios over there. Uh, similarly, kind of P increases across this axis, 
Um, and so over here, we're going to get our, our lowest uh, end to P ratio, so highest phosphorus, lowest end. Um, and then in the middle, kind of if you track the one to one, this is going to be the area with the highest total uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And then if you look up in the Z plane, um, this is where we're going to map uh, performance, either of the fungi uh, or the plant. Um, and so what we're going to do is uh, kind of use the data we get to map this response surface that charts fungal or plant uh, fungal growth or plant growth across these gradients. And then you can calculate the total volume occupied under that surface using something known as a convex hole. And while biomass isn't a perfect representation of fitness or population dynamics, um, we can use this as our best po possible representation of the niche space that's occupied by each species. So this is the niche space uh, that we mapped out um, using this approach for soilless pungens. And you can see there's a few things that uh, jump out right away. So first, uh, if you look kind of over here, um, you'll see that uh, colonization is lowest either when nutrients are kind of at, at their absolute low or over here where there's lots of nitrogen and, and not very much phosphorus, so kind of uh, high end to P ratios. Um, and then by contrast, you can see that uh, colonization is highest over here um, where phosphorus levels are very high, uh, but nitrogen levels are relatively low. So N becomes the most limiting nutrient and this is where uh, Soila seems to do best. And so it's actually the ratio of these two nutrients um, as well as the absolute magnitude of their concentrations, but uh, the ratios are really important that tend to predict uh, niche occupancy uh, for this fungus. So if we go to Celephora, this is where uh, things get even more interesting. You can kind of see that there's the uh, exact opposite pattern. And so you can see that uh, its peak um, is where N is abundant. So these are kind of the areas where uh, our highest nitrogen levels and phosphorus is kind of over here um, at its lowest level. So it kind of peaks over here when there's lots of nitrogen uh, and not much phosphorus in the system. And by contrast, um, when there's a lot of phosphorus um, and uh, not much N, uh, this is when it has its lowest colonization levels. Um, and when you put uh, both fungi together, um, what you actually get is kind of maximal colonization across this surface, um, which suggests that having multiple partners allows the plant um, some environmental flexibility. Um, so unfortunately, we didn't uh, separate out uh, fluffer terrestrial and soil's pungens colonization because this is already a lot of work. So we don't know who was colonizing where, but um, that would be an interesting next thing to try and do. Okay, yeah, so there you can see those, those are the two areas where, in general, when there was a single species, either uh, Soilus maybe failed to colonize over here and Philephora failed to colonize over here, but by having both of them together, the plant is able to maintain maximal colonization levels. So I want to turn now to the plant side um, and think about how this resource specialization from the fungi affects post-plant growth. And this figure is a little bit different because now we're comparing plant biomass um, uh, uh, between uh, the control of these non-mycorrhizal plants with the colonized plants. And so when you look at this figure, uh, the warm colors are going to show where the, the fungus improves plant growth or it expands the plant niche. Um, and these cool colors show where it contracts the plant niche or, or reduces the plant niche or reduces plant growth relative to the control. And so for Soilis um, on the left here, um, you can see that this is a somewhat complicated response surface. Um, but that in general, uh, plant biomass is most approved here, kind of at the top right, uh, where P is abundant, but nitrogen is limiting. All right, And this makes a lot of sense. Uh, this reflects what we saw with the uh, Sewellus colonization data uh, to large, in a large part. All right, And for Telephora, again, uh, we see the opposite pattern, um, where Telephora seems to maximize plant growth uh, when N is pl plentiful and P is limiting. All right, so this uh, together, this kind of suggests that um, this niche specialization of the fungi is directly reflected in this mutualistic niche space that is able to be occupied um, by their plant host. All right, so the next part, um, maybe some of you were thinking this, that um, and this is what I expected, is that um, because these two fungi have really complementary nutrient niches, um, what it seems to suggest is that the host could then maximize the environmental niche space it can occupy by having a diversity of partners and uh, switching associations depending on the environmental context, right? Okay, so this is where, uh, if you thought that uh, you were wrong um, and I was incorrect. And well, so we found uh, something quite different. So this is the figure that looks at uh, plants growing with both the Lephora terrestris and Soilus pungens. And what we find actually is that having, uh, in this particular experiment, having two partners tends to depress the benefits that you get from being uh, mycorrhizal. So over here in the this top left corner, um, what we see is that with Philephora terrestris, we're actually able to maintain pretty comparable benefits 
um, when phosphorus is limiting and there's lots of nitrogen, it still seems to improve um, plant growth. But when you look over here at the place where Thalephor or Suilus um, tends to be the uh, uh, beneficial for the plant host, um, that actually these benefits tend to get uh, suppressed here in the presence of Thalephora. Um, and so this is probably because uh, Swillus pungens is actually kind of a weak competitor. Um, and so that in the presence of another fungus, uh, it's not really able to confer the benefits that it might otherwise um, uh, to the host. And interestingly as well, you can see that um, it, there's also this kind of exaggeration of this, um, of this kind of poor performance space here in the middle. Um, and this is where kind of neither N or P are limiting. Uh, so these are kind of uh, in kind of equal stoichiometry compared to what uh, the plant probably needs. Um, which is actually quite interesting that um, it's more about um, which nutrient is, is, is or isn't limiting that determines uh, you know, when a fungus can actually be beneficial. All right, so it seems like these fungal interactions um, can actually have a negative effect on the host and complicate our understanding of uh, functional complementarity. Um, so just to summarize, uh, while this is a really labor intensive thing to do, um, it's possible to use these kinds of approaches to map out uh, what we think of as niche space uh, for symbiotic organisms and look for evidence of this mutualistic uh, niche, um, which we see, uh, I think, in this particular study. Um, and I think doing this actually reveals some really informative things about the nature of the nutrient niche for Sewillus um, and other fungi. And so, as I said, first, we see that absolute nutrient concentrations are, of course, important, but really that also these relative concentrations and stoichiometry of nutrients are really important as well. And what this means is that these two niche axes are interacting with each other. And you can't understand a, a niche axis alone. So if we just measured you know, soilless growth along uh, an, an axis of nitrogen and tried to predict how it would, uh, it would do on different, um, when you had, if you had different sort of levels of phosphorus, you couldn't do it. So you need to measure both of these axes uh, at the same time. Um, and then finally, um, we saw that even though there is interesting niche differentiation between these two fungi in a way that suggests functional complementarity in a very appealing way, um, in contrast with this kind of avatar view of the world where everything is functioning for the good of the whole, uh, we see that these interactions between in individual fungi are often antagonistic and need to be accounted for when we think about things like functional complementarity. Okay, so hopefully it's quite obvious how um, you know, defining the nutrient niche space or the recruitment niche of soilless pungents can determine, you know, help us understand what kinds of habitats it might occur in or where it might be beneficial. Um, so why is this important more broadly? Um, and the thing I'm going to argue is that this regeneration niche and this nutrient niche for soilless pungents actually dramatically influence the rest of the environmental and microbial community through this process of uh, niche construction. Okay, so niche construction is the process by which an organism alters its own or another species local environment and thus changes the selective pressures that they or another organism experience. So how does this apply to Sewellus pungens? Well, we know that um, based on this regeneration niche that Sewellus is one of the most common partners of pine seedlings establishing in coastal scrub vegetation. And we've shown in other experiments that the presence uh, of Sewellus pungens is really critical for pine seedlings to be able to outcompete uh, seedlings of this other really dominant arbuscular mycorrhizal shrub, um, Baccharis pilularis, that coyote bush. Um, and so, you know, Suillus pungens dispersal ability uh, can really help change the trajectory of the plant community by helping its, uh, you know, helping its uh, host plant establish and outcompete um, and uh, outcompete other plants and kind of transform the plant community. And we know that um, the type of plant species um, and what root symbioses they have um, can lead to very different trajectories in the development of the overall soil chemistry of plant rays, um, really changing the soil nitrogen uh, carbon concentrations of the pH. And we, this is from a study by a, a postdoc from my lab, uh, Marie Duhamel. We looked at um, you know, 20 years after uh, fire, what a change in vegetation from baccarus to say either bishop pine Ceanothus um, or staying the same as Baccharis would do to the soil chemistry. And it has really extreme uh, effects. So you can often lead to, uh, I think we calculated this over um, the extent of a fire that had been there. This can lead to changes in things like uh, thousands of tons of carbon and hundreds of tons of nitrogen, depending on which way these uh, plant communities are shifting. And we also know that the establishment of these different plant species and the changes in the soil environment change the selective environment for the rest of the microbial community. And over the 20 years, we've tra tracked these changes uh, in plant communities and their effects on the overall soil microbial communities. We see really different trajectories depending on 
uh, which uh, plant species establish and how the environments change for the entire community of fungi, bacteria, and archaea, not just for ectomycorrhizal fungi. Uh, and this, of course, changes the feedback, uh, feeds back to change the fitness landscape for Sewellus pungens uh, itself. Okay, so hopefully um, I've convinced you that this bottom-up approach is an interesting and useful way to think about fungal communities, um, and that a deep dive into the ecology of a, a single species can actually help us to make better uh, broad generalizations uh, about what's driving uh, the uh, community assembly for the entire fungal community. Um, and with that, I will say thank you, uh, and I'd be happy to answer questions when it's done.